Hello and welcome to History and the New Testament, the Bible studies that we've been doing going through the New Testament and trying to put it into its historical context. We've been looking at the Colossian Church for the last couple of weeks, and today I want to wrap up with Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities by putting them to open shame by triumphing over them in it. Remember, the Colossian church was a church that Paul had not planted, Paul had not visited. It was a church that was planted by his good friend Epiphras. And there was a problem at the Colossian church. It was a problem in a lot of the churches in the first century called the Jewish controversy. Jews would come from the Jerusalem church and they would say things like this. Jesus was a Jew. If you wanted to follow Jesus and be like his first disciples, then you also needed to become Jews. And they started going around different churches and different churches started writing to Paul to ask him about this controversy. And some of these writings that we have, like the book of Galatians, the book of Colossians, are Paul's response to that controversy. In Colossians 2 verse 15, Paul writes, He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. So what does Paul mean that he disarmed the rulers and the powers? That he put them to open shame and that he triumphed over them. Well, for us to understand this, we first need to understand the Roman triumph. See, Roman triumphal arches were erected all over the Roman Empire, and they showed off Rome's greatest victories. They told of battles and of glory, and they pointed to the triumph awarded to Roman generals. Some of the most famous triumphal arches that appeared around the empire were the ones to Augustus and the ones to Titus. Titus his was a, about the Jewish revolt in AD 66 and the conquering of Jerusalem in AD 70. So what was this triumph? Well, you see, the city of Rome had a boundary and no army was allowed to enter into the city. And once they did, they would become ordinary citizens and that included their general. There's only one exception and that was the Roman triumph. It was the biggest honor the apex of a general's career and an acknowledgement that this was one of Rome's most powerful people. And a big parade was given where a general and those under his command were given permission to enter the city of Rome for one day and celebrate their victories. And there were certain qualifications that a general had to meet in order for this to happen. He had to conquer new territory. He had to be des designated imperator or commander by his troops. He then had to go to the outskirts of Rome, ask the Senate to come meet him. And if the Senate agreed, he would tell of all his deeds and accomplishments and ask their permission to enter the city of Rome. If the Senate agreed to this, they would go and ask the plebeian assembly to vote on it. And if the vote came back yes, the city would shut down and all the people would gather to watch this parade. There were three stages to a triumph. The first was the educational stage. This is where wagons showing off Rome's new territory with paintings and murals. And it would be accompanied by wild exotic animals like elephants and giraffes. Wagons would then show key battles and events in the general's campaign. Followed by more wagons displaying the spoils of war. Following these wagons would be the defeated monarch in his full royal clothes and his army accompanying him in chains. Next would come the triumphal general. The general would be dressed in full purple, signifying that he was royal. He would be appearing on a gold chariot pulled by four white horses. He would wear a laurel crown and hold a gold scepter in his hand. And he would appear to the people as both a king and a god. Following the general would be his army. And they would follow a parade route. They would enter through the triumphal gate of Rome. They would march to the Circus Maximus. They would go inside the Circus Maximus and make a few laps for the adoring people. And the crowds roar as the general entered the stadium would be heard throughout all of Rome. 
the general would then march his army to the Temple of Jupiter. The Temple of Jupiter, that's where the captured soldiers would be killed, and the general would make a sacrifice of bulls to Jupiter. Following this would be feasts and games for days. Now Paul writes in our text that Jesus did this. Jesus triumphed over the powers and the authorities. He shamed Satan and the rulers and the powers. And he did this on the cross. This is what he writes. The record of debts God set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in it or in the cross. So what does this mean? Well, listen to what N.T. Wright says, the um, renowned New Testament historian. Jesus had been crucified as the climax of the strange saving plan of God. How are you going to invest that event with its full significance? Impossible. But one step towards it is to borrow the language of a military triumph, which was, of course, all the more ironic since the literal space-time world, what had actually happened was that the principalities and powers seemed for all the world to be celebrating a triumph over Jesus. The world thought that they had gotten the better of Jesus. The powers thought that they had gotten the better of Jesus. Satan thought he had gotten the better of Jesus. In fact, there's graffiti in the Palatine Hill in Rome that depicts someone worshipping a donkey on the cross, and underneath it, it says, Aleximenos worships his god. And this type of graffiti showed what the Romans and the world thought about Jesus dying on the cross. So why did Paul use this image? Well, he did it because Jesus defeated Satan on the cross. Jesus is the victor. And we are in the crowd praising Jesus' name and victory. The people of Colossae would have understood this. They would have known that it would have shown the complete victory of Jesus. It would have rendered the arguments that the Judaizers made as obsolete. Over the past three weeks, we've studied Paul's argument against the Judaizers, and this is his full argument. You don't need to become Jews in order to become Christians because, one, Jesus made you alive by canceling your debt by becoming actual sin on the cross. Now, two, Jesus triumphed over Satan and put him to open shame, once again, on the cross. And then three, the symbols of the law and the feasts and the Sabbaths are nothing but shadows. Their actual substance is Jesus. And you can hear the people of Colossae saying, but Paul, you're in prison. Paul wrote this book from prison, waiting his trial with Nero. And you can see that the people are saying, Paul, you're in prison. Doesn't that make you have less authority? If what you are saying is so true, why do people get so upset with you? Well, remember when we looked at Plato's cave, the analogy is the one who was freed and saw the sun and saw the substance. The one who was free and saw Jesus for who he truly is. When he comes back to the cave and tries to tell the people who were chained up, they get free, they kill him, they beat him because they don't know and understand what he's trying to say. And so Paul says, that actually gives me more authority because I know what I have seen, and I'm telling you who Jesus is. What does this mean for us? Well, when we explain the good news of Jesus, we need to understand our culture. We need to understand its stories, its narratives, understand its idols, and use images that the culture around us understands. But we also need to make sure that we don't make new Christians jump through hoops. They're alive in Jesus. Jesus is the victor. We are celebrating with them the good news of Jesus, that Jesus has defeated Satan on the cross. He has triumphed over him. He is that general going through the city with the defeated hordes of Satan and the principalities and powers bound before him, and he is putting them to open shame. So let's celebrate together. Let's celebrate what Jesus has done, and let's celebrate 
with those around us, the Christians around us, without putting them through unnecessary hoops. Well, that's it for this episode. I hope that you've enjoyed it. I know I have. And I hope that you'll join me again next week when we look at more history of the New Testament. Until then, God bless and have a good week.